Good morning, everyone. The title of my presentation with you is When Life is Interrupted. Let me tell you about a funeral I did uh, not too long ago. Uh, the church was absolutely packed for this funeral for a woman named Linda Nersessian. Linda was a 42-year-old woman who died of breast cancer in our parish after a long and brave battle. She was a very successful businesswoman, also highly cherished wife and mother of two children, George, who was 11, and Lulu, who was eight at the time. It's one of those funerals that I just will never forget. I remember sitting in the pastor's chair in the front of the chancel, looking out at the front pew right here where Linda's family was, her parents, her um, widower now, husband, George and Lulu. We got through the liturgy as best we could. Um, I remember as we were saying the 23rd Psalm, it didn't sound right to me. Uh, particularly when I got to the part of um, Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. And I thought, you know, actually we're all in want of this woman. This death I could never make sense of. What parishioners often don't understand is that when pastors are leading services for funerals, they're also in grief themselves. And we have to kind of fight back our own tears just to get through the liturgy of the funeral. There were two eulogies and, uh, that came first in the, in the service. And we, um, they said what you would expect them to say. They were both from Linda's friends. They talked about uh, what an extraordinary woman she was. We were defended and protected as best we could as these two women uh, got through their eulogies as best as they could. But we weren't prepared for the third eulogy, which was given by George, uh, her little boy. I can still to this day see him standing up at a podium like this. I had to kind of get up on his tippy toes. His weeping father, Ray, was standing behind him. He reached into his pocket, and he pulled out a loose-leaf piece of paper. And then he began to read. He says, thank you all for being here to say goodbye to my mommy as she goes to heaven. I want you to know a couple of things that Lulu and I are going to miss about mommy. When we would come home, she would always be there in the kitchen. And it was wonderful to walk in the door knowing that mommy was there waiting for us. And at the end of the day, when it was time to go to bed, we would race upstairs and jump into the bed and have tickling contests before she would read us a story. And then I'm going to miss that, too. Holds up his paper, stuffs it back in his front pocket, and he sits down. The tenor soloist then begins to sing, Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. I was amazed at how the music just waged war on all of our defenses at this point. And we all surrendered to the grief by the time the soloist was done. Now it's my turn to speak. <laughs> Only I can't speak. And nobody else was volunteering to speak anymore either. <laughs> so we just sat there in the silence for a long time. That's what I remember the most about that service, is the silence. Now eventually, I had to go to the pulpit and proclaim holy words, because that's my job, to speak into that silence. I've seen this silence before, and I've seen it a lot. Uh, it's the same silence that shows up in cemeteries. When I'm standing next to a widow or a widower, and we're just staring at a tombstone, remembering a death. It's the same silence you find in nursing homes late at night. Nursing homes late at night are some of the quietest places on earth. It's the same silence that you find in a bedroom when a child has a dangerously high temperature. It's the same silence that you find on the 
telephone when a friend from the East Coast calls to say, my son was killed in an accident. And you, you stammer a bit and you say, I, I, I don't know what to say. Right. Right. No words that are human can stand up to that very powerful silence. But the reason people gather in churches for funerals, the reason people ask their priest to come down to the emergency room, is because we want to know if God has a word that can stand up to the silence, this powerful, powerful silence. Is there a word that can pierce the silence with any kind of hope? And that's called the word of God. A word that can finally stand up to this terrifying silence that strips away all human words. Sooner or later, every life gets interrupted by something. Nobody lives the life they had planned. I mean, who here is living the life they had planned? <laughs> Nobody. Now, some of these interruptions at times are wonderful. You fall in love. There's a reason why we call it falling in love. You, it's like you're you were walking along fine, and then you trip. And you, you realize, I'm in love. My life has just taken a permanent change. That's a wonderful interruption. Some of the interruptions are quite subtle. You go to the mirror one morning and realize you're staring at your parent. <laughs> you wonder, when did that happen? It's called aging. It's an interruption that finds all of us. One of my parishioners told me about a time that she was vacuuming the living room carpet, thinking about her job. She looked out the back window. She saw her five-year-old boy throwing a ball up in the air and clumsily trying to catch it. And she couldn't stop crying, just looking at this child throwing the ball in the backyard and it reoriented all of her priorities. Some of the interruptions are very tragic. A woman is showering one morning, she finds a lump, she gets it tested, she's in for a long, hard journey. Your boss comes into your office, shuts the door, sits down, tries to explain about downsizing and you're worried about your mortgage. Anytime these interruptions occur, your life is suddenly not in the familiar place anymore. It's off to a different place. The only way to get from one place in life to the next place in life, according to scriptures, is to go through a barren place called the desert wilderness. Isaiah 43, verse 18 says, Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Everyone in scripture who is of any use to the biblical drama has to spend time in the desert wilderness. Their lives get interrupted. They have to go to another place, and the way they get there is through this desert wilderness. It is the fundamental metaphor in scripture of getting from Egypt to the promised land. You can't get from the former life in Egypt, to the promised land without going through the wilderness. Well, nor can we grow in our spiritual lives or mature into the creations God is trying to create of us without getting through the wilderness. But it's a hard place to go. When the Bible uses the image of a desert wilderness, it's not talking about luscious, green, North American forests. It's, it's talking about hard, ugly desert. And the ancient people didn't like the desert. There were no back-to-nature movements in ancient society. <laughs> the, the desert scared them. I mean, people died out there. These were village people. They went from village to village. If they had to go through the desert, they did it as fast as they could. It's a hard place. You can only get through the desert with complete and total dependency on God, which is exactly why you're there. You're learning faith. You're learning trust. You're learning that your life is not going to be what it used to be. It's now going to be something else, something new. The fundamental paradigm in Scripture 
for change is that we go through orientation, an oriented life, to a disoriented life, to a reoriented life. We find this in the prophets. It's all over the Psalms. Oriented, disoriented, reoriented. Life starts off in a place where everything seems fine. You ever have your life like that? Like your life is just right. Everybody in your family is healthy. They're all happy. They all like you. <laughs> you have your friends around. Your work is going well. Ever get life just like that? Take a photograph. Because <laughs> you're going to want to remember that. Something happens. Something interrupts this well-oriented life inevitably. And then you move into a stage of disorientation. Remember when the Hebrews left Egypt on their way to the promised land? That was God's idea. It wasn't the Hebrews' idea. Their idea was that they were oriented to their misery. They were complaining a lot. And some people are very well oriented to their misery. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> this makes no sense, I know. But people prefer the misery they know to the mystery they do not. It's not logical. Logically, mystery would beat misery. But people befriend their misery. It becomes somebody that they, something they know. They trust their misery. I did a sermon series once on um, Lazarus and, and his tomb. And it was kind of a difficult time in my own life. And it, it occurred to me as I was doing this sermon series that what I was expecting is that Jesus would go into the tomb uh, and help out Lazarus. But you, you notice in the text that he doesn't do that. Jesus stands at the door and invites Lazarus to come out of the tomb. That's not what we want. We want Jesus to come and make our misery more comfortable. Do a little redecorating of the tomb. <laughs> fix it up a bit. That's not going to happen. Jesus doesn't like tombs. He didn't spend much time in his own. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's, he's not going in yours. Instead, he stands at the door and he says, it's time to come out. But one of the ways he says it's time to come out is to get us to a disoriented life. So the Hebrews had their comfortable misery for 400 years. And God says, okay, enough's enough. It's time to come out. He takes them out into the desert. And as soon as they get into the desert, their lives are very disoriented. And what do they keep saying in the desert? It was so good back in Egypt. Can't we go back? When your life is disoriented, the temptation is great to get back to Egypt because it was the misery that you knew. And again, at least our souls can, can get comfortable with that. But when your life is disoriented, there is no going back. The only way is to move ahead through this mysterious, strange, unknown life until life is finally reoriented. And you discover that you are a different person. And at that point, you give thanks even for the interruption because of the changes that have occurred in your life along the way. But most of the time, though, when you're stuck between where we had to leave and where we're going, the where we're going just seems like a vague promise. Paul says, he who hath begun a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. That's a promise. We just have to we cling to that, that that's coming. What we know is more about the disoriented life that we're living in the meantime. So God cares for us along the way in this middle section, this disoriented life. And the way that he does is with the gift of manna. Remember the story of the manna is the Hebrews went through the desert. Every morning God would shower down manna from heaven. And that's what kept them alive. The manna came with some regulations. Everybody had to get their own. Uh, There's no group plan. Uh, you had to get it every day. And it wasn't a whole lot. Just enough to keep you going. All wonderful metaphors for the spiritual life. We each have to maintain our own spiritual disciplines. Nobody can pray for you. You have to maintain your own prayer life. You have to do it daily. You can't, like, store it up. Like, I prayed yesterday. Do I ever have to pray again today? Yes. Uh, and... Again, nobody got fat on manna, and nobody ever feels spiritually full, right? You're not supposed to. The hunger is a constant hunger for God. It's a call to worship. But the reason I like the metaphor of the manna the most is because of its name. Manna is Hebrew for 
the question, what is it? Isn't that fantastic? What is it? Every morning, I guess it would be the moms who go out and get a big bowl full of what is it. <laughs> they bring it back. They prepare it. I'm sure the most creative way they could. There was no what is it helper in those days, though, so I, I don't know. And they, they put it on the table, and the kids would look at it and say, what is it? And the mom would say, yes. <laughs> so day after day after day along the desert sojourn, they're asking this question, what is it, God, that you're doing in our lives? What is it that you're asking of us? What is it that this is all headed toward? What is it that we're supposed to be about? What is it that's so wonderful about the promised land? Why couldn't we have stayed where we are? What is it? What, what, what is it? And that question keeps being asked for centuries and centuries and centuries, right up to the sixth chapter of John, where Jesus refers to the manna, and he says, you've heard of old there was, there was a manna from heaven. I am now the bread of life. I'm the new manna. Which means the answer to the century-old question, what is it, what is it, what is it, God, what is it, God, what is it, God, is Jesus. But Jesus is saying that he's the new what is it. Which means that the answer to the question is another question. But it's a better question. Now the question is, what is it that Jesus is doing in your life? Which means that if you have Jesus at work in your life, even in asking the question, what is it, Jesus, you're doing, you are now off the hook for having to be your own Jesus. He who hath begun a good work will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. You don't have to be Jesus. Jesus is Jesus. There is a Savior at work. And like his first disciples, we're often clueless about what the Savior is doing. But the daily question is, what is it, Jesus, that you're doing in my children's life? What is it, Jesus, that you're doing in my workplace? What is it, Jesus, that you're doing uh, in my own life? What is it, Jesus, you're doing in this church? What is it, Jesus, that you're doing in Syria? What is it? What, what? I don't get it. I don't see it. What is it? The entire job description for salvation is taken by Jesus. Our question is, what is it that you're doing, not what is it that I have to do to take over as Savior because I don't like the way you're doing the job. Meanwhile, our task then is to be faithful and just continuing to make our way through the calling that we have been given. You know, you spend a lot of time in the desert wandering around like the first Hebrews did. I think one of the most maddening part of that journey from Egypt to the Promised Land is there, there, was, no, there was no map. It just felt like another day wandering around, taking the manna, asking God, what is it that you're up to? And then the point of that whole journey is learning to have faith. So that when the Hebrews finally get to the Jordan River, they're able now to step in water that hasn't even been parted yet. Remember when the Red Sea, they got to the Red Sea, God first parted the waters, and then they had Pharaoh and all of his goons coming behind them. So they decide, oh, we'll walk through the water. Well, duh, yeah, um, not a big choice there. The water's already been parted for you. But after they're done with their desert sojourn, they've had enough faith that they now learn how to step into water that hasn't yet been parted. That step of faith. That's what, they, that's what you learn in the desert, you, through the hard times. You learn how to have this faith. And you do it just by daily following along, taking in the man, having the prayerful life, watching to see what Jesus is in fact doing. When Paul is near the end of his life, he's writing his prison epistles, he says things like this to the church in Philippi. Finally, these are like some of Paul's last words. You would thought he would have something more triumphant to say, but this is what he says at the end. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things you've learned and received and heard and seen, and the God of peace will be with you. These are his last words. Keep on doing what you know to do. This is an act of triumphant faith. You just keep doing the same things that you know to be right along the way. Even if life feels disoriented at the time. 
That's Paul's advice. What do I do now? You keep on doing what you know to be right. You maintain your commitments. You honor God with the gift of your life. You be a good steward of the day that you have. You be responsible to, to, uh, to the poor around you. You, you, you. you keep on doing what is honorable, what's commendable, what, what you know to be right. You keep on doing it. You do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. And it gives glory to God. God loves routine. This is not the good news you came to church to hear, but there it is. <laughs> God loves routine. Who do you think created routine? It's all God's idea. And think about how much of our life holds together by routines. Whether it's little things like um, electrons that have to keep going around in circles, or big things like planets that have to go around stars. If any of them stop doing these routines, we are in big trouble. And so the earth just keeps going around the sun, right? And it all gives glory to God. Winter, spring, summer, fall, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Winter, spring, summer, fall, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Catholic theologian G.K. Chesterton said, The sun rises every morning into the sky, not just because of the laws of science and nature, but because God commands the sun to get up there and do it again. He even says, God squeals with delight like a little child and says, do it again. Do it again. Have you ever taken a little kid and throw this kid up over your head like this, and the kid squeals, ah, and you put the kid down? What does he always say? Do it again. So you do it again. Ah, you put him down, do it again. You go through this six, seven times, it occurs to you, this kid's going to last at this game a lot longer than you are. (laughs) Why do children say do it again? Because they're made in the image of God who loves to see repeated, common, ordinary acts of faithfulness. That's what you learn in the desert. There's no heroism out in the desert. It's just another day. And often you're not even sure where you're headed in it. So you just keep following, you just keep doing what is faithful. But along the way, you're being transformed until eventually you get to this point realizing your whole life has been reoriented. It's just a hard journey. But at the end, it starts to make sense. When I was in uh, third grade Sunday school, the the state-of-the-art technology for teaching us was a thing called flannel graph. (laughs) Everybody under 50 is going, what? Um, Flannel graph is a large board that had flannel wrapped tightly around it, and it sat perched on an easel. And as the science school teacher would tell the story, she would take paper characters that had a little flannel tape on the back of them, and she'd put these characters up on the flannel board. It was always like a palm tree and a camel up there to start with for some reason. (laughs) And those of you who had flannel graph going up, remember this action? You put the character up there, and you would always have to do this to get it to stay stay up there, get it to stay in place. And... um, any time Mrs. Williams, my third grade teacher, who was my first theologian in life, uh, any time she used the Apostle Paul in one of the stories, he would take extra smoothing out <laughs> to get him to stay in place uh, because he had been overused in the story. Uh, that's why. Uh, one time, Johnny Burke and I got into a little fight over who was going to hand the apostle to Mrs. Williams, and we, we tore the apostle's head off. And <laughs> so she had to tape it back together, which made it hard to stay up there. Um, and some of the kids in vacation Bible school spilled Kool-Aid all over him, so he was purple. Um, but there he was. She kept him, you know, kept using the same apostle Paul. There he was in the story, discolored and taped together. And it was as if she was offering a holy mystery to us, even in the third grade. And the mystery was, God is not easy on the people God uses. 
Just because God uses you doesn't mean that God is going to be easy on you. When you look at all the people who have the most dramatic roles in the biblical story, at the end of their lives, they're all discolored and taped together. They've had a rough life. At the end of the apostle's life, he's, he's been kicked out of most of the towns in the Roman Empire, usually with a shower of rocks behind him. He's in jail. We assume that he was executed in jail. It hasn't been an easy life. But what does Paul talk about the most in his prison epistles? The surpassing joy of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. He wouldn't have had it any other way. Because he didn't want to have a protected life. He didn't want to have a comfortable life. He wanted to have a useful life. A life that mattered. A life that counted for something that even God cared about. And if that's your commitment, and it's certainly God's commitment for your life, that you get caught up in this great, wonderful, biblical drama called The Coming Kingdom of God, of course it's going to be hard at times. Of course. As your life is transformed into the image of Christ, some of that's going to hurt. Of course. But the reoriented life is one that has discovered its purpose. When I talk to the great old saints of the church, right before they die, all they want to talk about is the joy. And I know how hard their lives have been along the way. But they just talk about the joy because they saw a Christ at work through every mysterious moment, and they never settled for comfortable misery. In uh, his great work, um, uh, The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis um, depicts um, a bus ride from hell to heaven, at least to the base of a mountain uh, that leads to heaven. And it's kind of an image that he borrowed from uh, Dante's um, Divine Comedy. Lewis's point in The Great Divorce is that most of the people who began the journey to heaven turn around and go back on the bus because they're in hell because they want to be. The familiar misery. Most people who are in hell choose it. Same thing's true in Dante's Inferno. I mean, nobody, nobody's locked in there. This is the misery they know. It's what they want. Well, one guy, is on this journey, gets off the bus. He's just making his way up towards the mountain, towards heaven. Um, and an angel sees him. And the angel finds this guy is stuck on the journey. He can't get any further because he has a lizard on his shoulder. And this lizard is whispering something into the guy's ear. And the angel is puzzled by this. So he comes up to the man and he says, what, what are you doing with this lizard? And the man says, oh, I hate this lizard. Says he digs his claws into my shoulder. It hurts all the time. He says the most profane things about me into my ear. I can never get this message out of my ears. And the angel says, would you like for me to kill the lizard? And the guy says, well, let's not be hasty. <laughs> and the lizard says to the guy, hey, he'll do it. He'll kill me. He says, and, and we don't belong here. Let's get back on the bus and go back home to hell. Home to hell, where we belong. This, this thing goes on for pages and pages and pages in the Great Divorce. You get tired of this, this, this argument that this guy is having with this lizard. And uh, angels are kind of going, da, 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 da. he's got his sword, he's ready. And finally, the guy, at the end of this long discourse, this argument with the lizard and the angel, finally, the, the man says, uh, oh, the lizard says, don't let him kill me because who will you have if I'm gone? You will have nobody. Again, familiar misery. Eventually, the man says, All right, this is going to kill me as well, but I, I can't stand where Please, go ahead and kill the lizard. And the angel whips out his sword, cuts off the lizard's head, and the guy screams first. This was Lewis's profound point, that it hurts to get better. He screams first. And then in classic Lewis fashion, the lizard turns into a winged horse, and off the guy flies, <laughs> flies to heaven. Um, and so his liability is turned into this, this great asset. But I've thought of this often in uh, times that I've had parishioners coming to me for pastoral counseling, complaining about things like they, they're stuck in a job that they hate, but they have to have it to afford a lifestyle that they really don't like either. Uh, let's go over this one more time. You, it's, like, it's almost like, like I can see the lizard on their shoulder just whispering in their ear. 
what will you have if you don't have your misery? It's like expecting Jesus to come in and make your tomb more comfortable. The invitation is always to come out of that, but it hurts. It hurts to get better. It's the only way, though, to find your way to the reoriented life, to be like with the Apostle Paul at the end of your life, taped together maybe, but only wanting to talk about joy. Let me pray with you. Thank you, Holy God, for the fact that you never settle for what we do. Thank you for calling us to new life. Thank you for the gift of manna along the way that we're never abandoned, we're never alone. Give us the courage of the Spirit to keep on doing what we know to do, to live lives of faithfulness, and along the way to watch more of your creativity unfold in our lives. In the name of the Savior, amen. Thank you all.